town today amen good to see you i'm hoping you're you realize that this is uh christmas is next week and i just can't even believe that um you know i was doing a survey with the teen boys and uh, what i found out is so far the survey is 100 percent. not one of them has wrapped a present yet <laughs> and i was ragging on balaji um because he uh, said he put them in bags. And he was the first guy I talked to. I said, you only put them in bags? What's wrong with you? I was like, Balaji is now top of the list. I mean, you're like, woo! Man, I'm proud of you, man. That's awesome. <laughs> well, good to see you today. And uh, I'll tell you what, Sunday school is just a, just a great hour. And God already answered some of my prayers. Thank you, my brother. And uh, it's good to have the Hardings with us today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. As we start, Father, we're sure grateful to be in church today, and Lord, help us to, even now, uh, in our hearts, just adore you and praise you as we should every Sunday and through the week, Lord, but now is uh, just a special time in our lives where we're, we're in God's house with God's people, and we have God's book, we have God's spirit, and Lord, uh, we ask that you would just meet with us today in a special, wonderful way. Please watch over our services uh, today and services uh, across our nation and around the world as the gospel's preached and Christ is lifted. And we ask that uh, sinners would be drawn to thee and that Christians would be strengthened and encouraged in thee today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. All right. So, hey, good morning. Uh, let me go ahead and do the announcements real quick. So uh, in case you haven't noticed, we have Brother Chark parting with us all day today. Amen. All right. And if you missed Sunday school, you already missed a great lesson. So uh, um, please try to be here for all those. And thank you for coming again. Um, newcomers class, they're going to be having their grand opening. They already had their soft opening, but they're going to be having their grand opening January 8th. Any questions with that? See uh, Brother Tim Talbert. I don't see him in here today, but I think he's teaching the class. Um, and then coming up uh, next Tuesday, well, this Tuesday, the 20th, we are going to be caroling. So during the time that we're normally soul winning, this time we're going caroling, and this is going to be mass caroling, right? Yep. Cold turkey caroling. But we will be uh, passing out tracks. Amen. Time, so. All right. So cold turkey caroling, and we'll be passing out some tracks, probably invitations to yep. uh, the children's Christmas Eve special that will be taking place um, the 24th, Christmas Eve, and that's going to be from 5 to 7. All right, so that's, uh, that's on this Saturday. Now, Sunday, which is Christmas, <laughs> Sunday which is Christmas, we're actually going to be having church, but we're going to be having one service, and that is this service, the morning service, all right, the one that starts at, at 1030, all right. Um, following that, New Year's Eve, we're going to be having our New Year's Eve vision service, um, and that starts, that starts at 8, from 8 to midnight, and I know there's going to be a sign-up sheet for that. Um, 
I don't really have much information on that. I guess, see Brother Rich on that? Yeah, I'll mention it. Okay, okay good. All right. And then uh, New Year's Day, which will also be a Sunday, we're also going to have one service, and it'll, again, it'll be the, the morning service, the 1030 service. All right? So any questions? I'm going to quiz you later. No? All right. Well, amen. Amen. Thank you. You know, if you've never come Christmas caroling, uh, we want to invite you to come out. It's, it's uh, you know, nobody hears you singing. We're all together. And, and if you come for no other reason than to see the shock on somebody's face when we knock on the door and there's a busload of people standing in front of their door, uh, I'm just, I'm, that's one of my favorite things. And uh, we've never had anybody turn away tracks and stuff when we do that. So it's a great, great time. And uh, we are coming back for hot chocolate and just refreshments after. And it's a, it's a good way to, uh, uh, to celebrate Christmas together as a church. Amen. So and if you understand that uh, we're having the uh, Christmas Eve service, is what Brother Deb here was talking about. That's our Christmas Eve service. We do that once every seven years when it comes up. So uh, we have a Christmas Eve service, and this would be a great thing to invite uh, lost people to because yeah. the gospel is going to be given, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just perfect. It's wonderful, and uh, it's what Christmas is all about. You know, people go around, they sing these songs, and they're, they're singing about Christ and the birth of Christ, and they have no idea. So uh, that's uh, Sunday night, and then Sunday morning is that uh, special Christmas service. So uh, so we're excited. If you're going to be in town, uh, we're happy. If you're leaving, going to be with family or friends, uh, we pray that you have a wonderful, wonderful Christmas. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's stand together once again, please. Turn to 139 because of Christmas, why he came. He was born to die. Hymn number 139 for you and I <clears throat> or you and me. On the night Christ was born, just before break of morn, as the stars in the sky were fading, or the place where he lay, fell a shadow cold and gray, of a cross that would humble a king. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might live. Jesus knew. When he came, he would suffer in shame. He could feel every pain and sorrow. But he left paradise. With his blood he paid the price. My redemption to Jesus I owe. Born to upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive, born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might live, from his throne Jesus came, laid aside heaven's fame in exchange for the cross of Calvary. For my gain suffered loss, for my sin he bore the cross, he was wounded and I set free. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might live. Dearest Lord, never.
evermore. May thy cross I adore as I follow the path to Calvary. Of thy death I partake, my ambition I forsake, all my will I surrender to thee. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus, then I might live. You know, we, we uh, sing about Christmas and preach about Christmas all year round. Just around this time of year, we just say Merry Christmas to, to it. So, uh, yeah, I was thinking about that hymn, and uh, I remember, I don't know Ron Hamilton, but I remember him coming to Bible College and Capital Connection and things like that. And I remember him singing that song. Um, and, um, you know, and now he's probably getting ready to slip into eternity. Um, but, uh, man, how... How short life is and how wonderful uh, an opportunity we have right now yeah. to be alive today. I think these are the greatest days to be alive yeah. and to serve God. And so, um, and like, like Brother Hardy was saying this morning, I hope you realize when you woke up this morning, you know, where we are right now. So, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, uh, Brother Al's going to lead us in prayer as we worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings this morning. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, for this morning. Thank you, Lord God, for your son and dying on the cross for our sins, Lord. And as we remember it during this Christmas season, Lord, I thank you, Lord God, for the gift and the giver, Lord, for the offering. And please bless the remainder of our services, Lord. In Jesus' precious holy name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Meredith. Well, uh, great Sunday school lesson. We're excited Brother Hardy is here. You can uh, share your ministry, what's going on, but I'm, uh, you know, I was thinking this week that I wish, uh, you know, there were more Brother Hardings out there just traveling the country and willing to do what he does, and, and what, uh, what a wonderful influence uh, they are to, you know, leaders of our nation, and and, um, and I was thinking this, too, as you mentioned that, uh, brother with the cancer, that, you know, what you see on, new, on the news is not everything. And uh, there's things going on that we don't know about or we don't hear about that are encouraging. And, and hey, listen, God hasn't forgotten us. And uh, we're still his people. And, and uh, I'm thankful for today uh, that we could just be reminded of that and be brought to that. But God is so good. Love, Brother Hardy. Like I said, I'm I'm trying to figure out where he is, but he might be, he might be the top guy. I know with our family, that's, I think, I think so. Um, and of course in our church, um, and uh, he's also one of my favorite singers. And uh, so I asked him if he would sing tonight. So um, I love Brother Hardy and Mrs. Hardy, and I thank God for him. Brother. Thank you, Brother Connor. Love you, Brother. Appreciate it. All right. Well, yeah, just a little bit about 
our ministry for perhaps some folks that uh, haven't uh, heard about it before or, or haven't, I know there's a few hands that went up that uh, uh, you haven't heard me speak before. And so let me just, just very quickly <laughs> go through this. And, uh, and the fact of the matter is um, the fourth ministry now that God's allowed me to start by His grace and for His glory, and this is called Mission to America, and the prayer partnership that I'm establishing with pastors, state after state, week after week, if they're in session, uh, with our legislative leaderships. And they need it. They need to understand that there is a biblical mandate. And I've even been told so many times, and it's a wonderful thing to hear, uh, Brother Harding, when you come and you bring pastors, you know, we think much more of biblical principle than we do party politics. Now, I don't know about you, that's as, that's as good as it gets right, right there. And so we need to understand some things about our country. Um, the basis of a ministry is fivefold. Number one, we must get educated. We need to understand who we are. We are not any better than anyone else. We're, we're unique in the world. No one has it like we have it. No one in the world has it as good as we have it right here. In our country, there is some big problems going on. But even with the big problems, we're still the number one nation in the world. I, I mean, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else, anywhere else, would you? I wouldn't. I mean, there's no one that has it as good as us. And so we have uh, some materials back there that we can learn who we are and understand that liberty has been entrusted to us. First one is uh, a, a series of DVDs called America's Forgotten History, the Barbary Powers War, about the fact that Muslims tried to destroy us from the inception of our nation, fought us for 32 years. And uh, I love the fact that this puts someone back into history that was taken out, who was a personal soul winner. Say, so who are you talking about? I'm talking about a man that led the first Muslim congressman to the Lord Jesus Christ back in the 1700s. Uh, there was a fellow by the name of Keith Ellison. He said, I'm the first Muslim congressman ever elected. No, he doesn't know his history. The first Muslim congressman was elected back in the 1700s. But a man was there that was a personal soul winner. That happened to be the district attorney for Washington, D.C., and he led him to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, just like we would lead someone today and had him pray. Uh, that man uh, was taken out of history. I put him back in as a soul winner. His name, Francis Scott Key, right here. And I love the fact that the man that wrote our national anthem is also a personal soul winner. Isn't that great? I don't know about you. That gets me going. Amen? And then our biblical constitution, a lot of times people say, especially those people that are follow, following wokeism and the leftists, they say, oh, our our, our nation is not biblical. Oh, yes, it is. There's over 20 biblical principles in the Constitution of the United States. Now, this doesn't give the 20, but it does give you, you might say, an appetite to learn what they are. And uh, the fact that the men that had written in history that the Bible was so um, impactful as far as the Constitution, they were taken out. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the man that put all the ideas together for the Constitution, like... Jefferson put all the ideas together for the Declaration. Now, we know Jefferson because he didn't really <clears throat> go the way that this man went as far as saying that God and the Bible were uh, imperative in the founding formulation of our nation. And But most people don't even know who the man was that put all the ideas together for the Constitution of the United States. And uh, his name, let's say, well, who was he? Buy the DVD and you'll find out. No, I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. Okay, his name was Governor Morris. And a peg leg man spoke more than any other man during the Constitutional Convention, 173 times, only to be followed by James Madison that spoke 163 times. So he had a lot to say, and he had a lot to say about the Bible as it pertained to our foundation, our foundational government, the Constitution, our nation's capital. A two minute virtual tour through Washington, D.C., where I take the monuments and memorials, show you this is a Christian nation in its formulation and foundation, the seven foundations. How can we uphold the seven sacred foundations of our nation if we don't know what they are? I mean, that's kind of hard. That's trying, trying to basically protect the goal where you don't know the goal, where the goal is. But there are seven sacred foundations to our nation that we have to protect, that our nation rests upon. It's sustained upon them. And they listed, they're listed here in a very interesting DVD that I think you'll enjoy. And the sacred fire of the American pulpit. I'm going to be speaking a message that <clears throat> is basically the impetus of this DVD right here which is an amazing DVD that shows the unsung heroes of the War for Independence were the men that basically walked up behind the sacred desk, the pulpiteers of the day. Those men of God, be they pastors or intendant preachers, that went around and that was the very thing that God used. They were who God used to make our founding fathers who they were. 
And so that's about the sacred fire. And then the miracle of revival. A lot of times people say, well, this country was born out of revolution. No, this country was born out of revival. That's why our nation was, and our nation and its population was so amazingly changed <clears throat> by simply the gospel of Jesus Christ. A great awakening occurred. And that was the thing that brought us together, the impetus that brought us together to believe that we could go against the greatest military in the world. They had the greatest arsenal. They had the greatest armada of fleets in the world as far as shipping and war, men of war, a man, men of war ships when we didn't even have a navy and actually win. Uh, and um, they said, we're going to get on God's side. And we believe God's going to fight for us. Just like he fought for the people of Israel as they were released from the tyranny of Egypt. We believe that God's going to fight the people of, for the people of America to release us from the tyranny of King George III. Amen. I don't know about you. That gets me going. Amen. Now, if that doesn't excite you just a little bit, take this finger right here. Put it right there. Because if you don't feel a pulse, please raise your hand. You're dead. We'd like to carry you out before you start stinking up the place, okay? So I'm sitting in my own pew. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. A little play on words here. <laughs> This is a book called, okay, um, by the way, these, these are for a gift of $10 a piece. If you buy all six, you get all six for the price of five. So 50 buys all of those, and, and they represent thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars of production costs that God provided and years of study on my part uh, to bring these to light. And I, I know they will be a blessing to anyone that gets them. They're also a good Christmas present. I pray in Scripture through adversity. Uh, this is an amazing book. This is all of the... Uh, well, not all, but a lot of the great prayers of the Bible all categorize God has got my comfort, defense, help, refuge, guide, and uh, how to pray for others. That is a book that will change your life because that's the prayers. Those are the prayers of the Bible. We can pray the prayers of the Bible. You think about that. It's amazing. We can pray the same prayers. We read the Bible. We study the Bible. We meditate and, and uh, upon the Bible. But we don't pray the Bible like we should. And these are prayers that you can use that will help you get above the minutiae of circumstances in your life. And then there's constitutions. Please pick one up. If you're a veteran, you can pick one up for free. If not, that's just a, a gift of a dollar. And uh, that's a gift of $10, by the way. And, and if you buy any of these, I'll be glad to sign it. My wife and I will sign it because our signatures in $5 will get you a cup of coffee right down here. That's, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's how valuable our signatures are. And then uh, pick up a prayer card, pray for us. On the back, there's our website. It has some wonderful things, 100 Documents that made America is, are there. Uh, two music CDs, an old-fashioned quartet, and a solo CD. And so you can come tonight and hear me sing and then decide whether or not you want to buy a DVD, I think. I mean, CD. Uh, and then this one's free to every family or adult that's here without a family. Uh, this is the Bible Prayers for Revival. And it's an amazing book on how you can pray every day for revival in our nation, starting on Sunday and going all the way through Saturday. And uh, it's a book that I say, please don't read it, pray through it. There's wonderful things that you can pray. And uh, you say, well, how can you give it away for free? Someone gave us the money um, knowing that we had printed this. I didn't want to sell it. I wanted to give it to people. But I give it to people with a promise from them that they will pray through this book. And so, you know, if, if you're here and uh, you're a father of a family, pick one up for your family. If you're an adult, you can pick one up as well. We got, I, think, I think we have enough for everyone here. But the, the Bible prayers for revival. <clears throat> so I think that'll be a tremendous blessing to you. And the only way that we're going to see revival in our country is if we pray. If we get hungry for it. You think about it? When we, my wife and I go to Capitol Hill, you know what they say? They say, uh, here's the thing. There's only one hope for our country, and that's revival. Why are they there then? And voting and legislation to hold the floodgates back to give us a space of grace so we can have a revival. And I don't know about you, but I sure am glad there are the people there. I mean, I was just in Idaho, and uh, I, I spoke there all day at a church, uh, and a uh, great church out, out there, and a U.S. congressman came to hear me speak from Idaho. Independent Baptist, by the way. One of the few independent Baptist U.S. congressmen that there is. Russ Vulture is his name. Tremendous man, and he even came out and ate uh, dinner with us, part of the Freedom Caucus. And what they won't tell you on the news is the Freedom Caucus, after they go through a full day of legislation, they walk around the outside of the Capitol in every kind of weather imaginable and pray for our country. See, the news won't tell you that. Amen. As you've, said, as you've heard me say many times, 
the news is where they begin with good evening and then for the next hour proceed to tell you why it's not. So, hey, turn off the news sometimes and open up the good news. Uh, we need to read the good news more than we watch the bad news, don't you think? That'd be a smart idea? Yeah. I do. Yeah. And so are, are, are you glad to hear today? How many are glad that, that you're here in church today? How many would rather be here than the best jail in the area? Okay. I like that. That's good. Take your Bibles. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. And uh, we'll jump right into the message today. And so thankful to be here and, and love your pastor and his family and this church family. I think about you every day. I think about you and pray for you every single day of the world. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to pray for people. And uh, I love praying for people because it just, it helps me to feel that I'm closer to them, you know. And so I'm, I'm thankful that God allows me to pray and, uh, and helps me to pray uh, for, for people. And, and it's just wonderful to understand that God has given us the purpose in prayer, the uh, power in prayer. And uh, my, my two pages are sticking together. And so there we are. It's open now. It's like opening a present. Amen. That's, that's what we should look at the Bible like every day. Opening a great present. Right? Amen. And uh, so I'll be, I'll be sensitive to the time. I, I'm looking at the clock back here. Uh, I, I don't know if <clears throat> I ever told the story, but I like the story. So I'm going to tell it again about the man watching his wife's cat. And she was over in Europe. And, and uh, she called and said, how are you doing, honey? He said, I'm fine. How's the trip in Europe? She said, it's going great. She said, uh, by the way, how is my cat doing? And uh, he said, without any hesitation, the cat's dead. And now, it didn't bode very well with his wife because she loved her cat. Long silence. Finally, she said, you're very insensitive. He said, what do you mean? She said, you should have broke that news to me gently. He said, well, like how? You could have said, uh, y- your cat got up on the roof, and, and your cat's on the roof, and I tried to get it down off the roof, and it fell, and it hurt itself, and could have called you the next day, and you could have said, I'm kind of concerned about your cat, took it to the vets, and he's checking it out. I don't know. Uh, what's going on? Maybe some internal injuries or something. I could have called you the next day, and you could have said, he doesn't really hold out much hope for your cat. And I'm, I could have called you the fourth day, and you could have said, my cat, you could have broke that to me gently. He said, okay, I'll try to be more sensitive. And so they hung up, <coughs> and he called, <coughs> and she called him, I should say, about a week later. And she said, how are you doing? He said, fine. How was the trip over in Europe? She said, so it's good, good doing good. We're in some meetings. And, and they talked about a couple of things. She's fine. She said, by the way, um, how's my mom been doing lately? He said, your mom's on the roof. <laughs> so I don't think he learned his sensitivity lesson exactly the way he wanted to. Shut, shut your mouth, okay? Young lady, shut your mouth. In case there's flies around here, okay? <laughs> it's a joke, okay? It's a joke, all right? Okay. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 3, something very interesting going on here, I think, that you might say it's a transition. Now, this is during the time of the judge system, okay? And the judges were that particular presiding official that over Israel for a certain amount of time connected with God, and they would say, thus saith the Lord, and they would tell them what to do from God's perspective via their constitution. Said the Israel people had a constitution. Yeah, 613 commandments. That was their constitution given to them by God. With the top 10, the tenure of his word, the 10 commandments. And then, of course, 230, let's see, 248 of them were personal and positive, and 365 of them were um, collective and negative. So, what are you talking about? 248 personal, positive. God gave them these commandments that were for them, and if they followed them, God would bless them. That's pretty good, isn't it? 248 ways you could be blessed. Wouldn't you like to do that? Yeah. Hey, Lord, I want to know 240 different, 240 different ways how I could be blessed. And God said, here they are. It's also very interesting to me that there are 248 bones and sinews that hold together the human body. <laughs> See how God is making mistakes. And then the leftover of the 613 just happened to be 365 the number of days in a solar year, even though the Jews followed the lunar year, we followed the solar year. And so they were collective at how you were supposed to conduct yourselves among other people. So those are the thou shalt not. So don't do this and don't do that, right? And so the presiding official, that judge, was connected with God and then people. And he was the one that basically gave them, you might say, the way to live in some of the more particular areas of the commandments, or as we would say, the Constitution. 
Eli <clears throat> is about to shuffle off the scene. Uh, Eli, by the way, has become, <clears throat> you might say, in his older years, rather dim of sight, also dim of vision. And where there's no vision, what? People perish. And so here, something very interesting to me that I want to show you this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the, Lord, the word of the Lord was precious. In those days, there was no open vision. Now, that word precious means rare, okay, in this connotation. It means rare because it says in the next phrase there, God explains that there's no open vision. Where there's no vision, the people perish, as we've already said. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, so not just spiritual but physical dimness, that he could not see. Look at this now in verse 3, very interesting to me. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute here. Ere the lamp of God went out, right before it went out. <clears throat> see what we're talking about here. It was down to a flicker. This was the sacred fire that God had lit 350 years before this moment in time. And it was never supposed to go out. Here it's down to a flicker, dangerously close to going out because of Eli and his dimness spiritually, not just physically. Let's go on. And the Lord, verse 4, called Samuel. And he answered, Here am I. And he ran to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. The Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. So just a little boy. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came <clears throat> and stood, as at other times Samuel called, excuse me, as at other times called Samuel. Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said unto, so the Lord said to Samuel, excuse me, oh, behold, uh, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. And in that day I will perform against Eli all the things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. Why? Well, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth because his sons, his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. So God warned Eli. And he didn't heed his warning, and we're about to see a transition from Eli now to Samuel. I want to speak for a few minutes this morning on sacred fire. Heavenly Father, thank you again for loving us. And Lord, as we stand before thy word, we are amazed at the amount of truth that is there. Thank you, Lord, that your word is forever settled in heaven. Already, it's already there. Where our souls will be as long as we know you as our Savior. Lord, if there's one person here today that believes that going to church makes them a Christian or that believing the Bible or believing who you are or your son makes them a Christian, help them to know it takes more than belief. It takes receiving upon that belief by asking and accepting that gift of eternal life that we commemorate by the gifts that we give to each other here at Christmas time. Now, Father, as we go in to this message, Father, go in before us. Lead and guide us into all truth. As I step back, and surrender everything that I am to you. Father, you step forward and articulate my speech, clarify and direct my thoughts. But most of all, through and by your Holy Spirit, indwell me, fill me, Lord. And by that holy unction that only you can give him, give us. 
give us him, your comforter, that his presence might be readily evident and that we might have our minds and open, minds and hearts open unto him and we'll be very careful to give you all the praise and glory for what you're about to do. For we ask this in the precious name of your Son and our Savior and by the power and the merit and the authority that is the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. So the sacred fire of God, never supposed to go out. Extinguished in Israel? No, no, no. And yet here we see it down to a flicker. Now you say, oh, why are you bringing this to light? Because along those same types of biblical principles, sacred fire was instrumental in forging and tempering the United States of America to be the foundation of this nation, you might say, true course of action to spread the gospel, to be the epicenter of the proclamation that Jesus Christ came and lived 33 years and died on the cross and rose again the third day and sits on the right hand of the throne of God making intercession for us. That his blood, perfect, shed for us, can cleanse our blood. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad every time I go to the Lord and ask him to forgive me, he does. Amen? And cleanses me. And I've even heard preachers a lot of times say, well, your, your, your sins are black. No, they're not. They're red like crimson. Amen? And it's wonderful. And I think I brought this out here before, but it merits repetition. When you look at something red, through a red lens, it disappears. It's gone. It's white. Amen? And when God looks at our red sin through the blood of his son shed on the cross, our sins are white as snow. That's why we got to continue to come to God and put them before him. And he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow. Keep short accounts with sin. The miraculous history of the United States due to the sacred fire of the American pulpit, just like this one right here. The men of God preaching by the word of God through and by the Holy Spirit of God about the Son of God to the people who became the people of God is the very thing that made this country. The preachers from yesteryear, you know what they knew? They evidenced the truth of God's eternal word could change the life. Change my life. Change my eternal destination. Change the way that I looked. Change the way that I spoke changed the way that I basically conducted my entire life. You say, why? So that you could get to heaven? No, because I'm going to heaven. That's why. Amen. And I explained to someone, we don't go to church to get to heaven. We go to church because we're going to heaven. Amen. And we want to live a life that's more pleasing to God. Amen. Don't you want to go to God and say, Lord, I love you, and have him say, I know you do? Don't you want to go to the Lord and say, Dear God, I hope my, I lived my life today pleasing to you. And God said, yes, your life was well pleasing to me. The Lord actually talked about God. And God said, I'm pleased with my son all the time. I don't know about you. That's the greatest aspect of life. The greatest endeavor that we can do to reach that goal every day. Lord, that I might live my life that's pleasing unto you by seeing someone come to the knowledge of the truth. And I don't know about you. Hey, folks, I'm telling you, I sure am glad that when I was 21, 47 years plus ago, I accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. Amen. Amen. Never been the same since. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And that's the very thing that founders of our nation saw. They saw lives change, but they believe the Bible and the gospel could also change the course of a people and even birth a nation. Well, they were right, because the United States was born out of preachers of yesteryear, unashamedly preaching the whole counsel of God. And because of this, our founding fathers followed biblical truth in the formulation of a great republic, not a democracy, <laughs> okay, of our nation, and so ingrained in them from a child being taken out to listen to unlicensed preachers, they saw something in those preachers that were burning behind pulpits aflame with righteousness that his ministers were a flame of fire. This is not hearsay. Pastors and preachers of yesteryear knew 
that the secret of national greatness was allowing the almighty God to have preeminence and his word to be priority in their lives. I don't know about you. Man, that gets me going. I'm telling you, that excites me. How about being an American? It should excite you, amen? Because that's who we are. Amazing to me. Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 9 says this, 5 through 9. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do so in the land whithersoever you go, whither ye go to possess it. And keep, it says, keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom. Get this now. Your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nations. You know, for decades, the whole world looked to America. The whole world looked and emulated the Americas as a city on the hill, shining light. And now, instead of exporting morality, we're exporting immorality. Amen. Instead of exporting righteousness, we're exporting unrighteousness. And we, God's people, have to get before a thrice holy God and say, Lord, even though there are a lot of people going that way, Father, we're going this way. We want our nation to come back to you again. And you don't think he's going to honor a prayer like that? Oh, yes, he will. Yes, he will. He said, I taught you all these statutes. You shall hear all these statutes that I say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all that we call upon him for? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy son's sons. In June, I had the privilege, the great honor of preaching the last Medal of Honor recipient still alive from World War II, Woody Williams, who's been to this church, who your pastor met and, know, and knew. And he went to heaven, a born-again believer. Woody Williams, a tremendous man. Out of 473 World War II veterans, he was the last one still alive at 98 and going strong until he fell down a flight of 18 cement steps and it started to spiral down. Well, I was in Georgia preaching and his grandson called and said, Woody said, uh, he has it in your will that, that he wanted you to preach his, his funeral and he wants you to bring a gospel message. I said, I, I, I will. It'll be a great honor. I will do that. He said, it's probably going to turn into a state funeral. Well, it did at the West Virginia State House. And the governor was there, and the senators were there, and the congressmen were there, and generals and admirals were there, and the commandant of the Marine Corps was there, and the sergeant major of the Marine Corps was there, and other Medal of Honor recipients were there. And the day before, the night before, I was there with the family, praying with the family, and one of the Marines, because the Marines were getting a little bit woke too, I'm sorry to say, said, we need to have a uh, protocol meeting. I said, protocol meeting? I knew what was coming. I said, well, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Because the man whose remains lay underneath that flag-draped coffin that you're honoring right now, that Marine wants me to preach a gospel message. And I'm going to do that. Amen. And I'm not only going to preach a gospel message, I'm going to lead people in a prayer of salvation silently. If they want to get saved, I'm going to lead them in a prayer how they can get saved. We said a few other things. And, and uh, so the next day, the protocol meeting was called off. <laughs> Because I told him what I was going to do. And they kept on stressing, oh, what do you want an hour funeral? He wanted an hour funeral. He wanted an hour funeral. And uh, I, they left me three minutes to preach the message. I, I took 22 minutes <laughs> and preached a message, a simple go gospel presentation, and even told them to close their eyes and bow their head and repeat after me if they would like to know the Savior that Woody had received as Savior. And there were people that came up to me. I couldn't even see anyway. There was no raising hands because it was all dark in that particular area of the West Virginia State Capitol. Um, but I said, if you get saved, come and tell me or one of the families um, and family members because we'd like to know. And people came up and were talking to me and in their own words saying that they had accepted the Lord as Savior. And uh, you, you won't even believe who some of the people were, but that's another story. But what I'm saying is I I'm not going to forget those men yes. that went before us that put their life on the line. And most of the Medal of Honor recipients don't live. They, their families are given their medal. But few of them miraculously live. And I've been 
greatly honored to know many of Woody was one of the very best. Everyone that knew Woody felt that he was their best friend. Amen. What a wonderful thing. Hey, we can't forget. We can't forget the men who stood behind pulpits that put into our founding fathers a sacred fire that brought them to a point where they were willing to put everything on the line for you and I. That would have never happened. Those men that were royalty or wealthy would have never done what they did had they not had a fire burning within them. I don't know about you. I want that fire burning in me. What about it? I want burning. I, I've got the habit. I, I must have that fire burning. I don't want to be driving my life. How about you? Because if we drive our life, guess what? We're going to make some wrong turns. Amen? How many of you men in here would say, there was a time in my life before the GPS that I told my wife, this is a shortcut. Oh, yeah. And it was anything but a shortcut. Raise your hand. Let me see. And the rest of you liars hit the altar because we've all done a shortcut that wasn't a shortcut. Amen. But what I'm saying is, I don't want to drive my life. I want to be driven by God. I want to have consuming within me a sacred fire. Amen. Thomas Jefferson said the pulpit oratory ran like a shock of electricity through the whole colony. Another historian said the ministers of the revolution, like their pilgrim predecessors, were bold and fearless in the cause of their country. No class of men contributed more to carry forward the revolution and to achieve independence than did the ministers. In 1898, a historian by the name of Charles Galloway said, quote, mighty men they were, men of iron nerve and strong hand and unblanched cheek, hearts of flame, they had burning in them a sacred fire. God needed not reeds shaken by the wind, not men clothed in soft raiment, but heroes of hardihood and lofty courage, and such were the, the sons of the mighty who responded to the divine call. These were the men that were the moral force of the war for independence that put their stamp of approval upon them going up against the British. The British called it a pastoral revolt. Get that. And when the British came, you know what they did? One of the first things they did? They hunted down and tortured to death many of the pastors that had simply followed God's will in preaching his word about the country that they lived in. And many times they burned down their churches with their congregations inside of it. Men, women, and children. You see, our U.S. history has been a little sanitized. Some of the British, not all, but some of the British were very visceral people, very cruel people. Many don't understand that our founders were not heroes. They weren't getting ready to pucker. They were getting ready to spit when they saw many of our founding fathers because only one-third of our populace was on the side of the patriots. Two-thirds were against them. And so the slights of men, the forced you know, criticism, the lies didn't, didn't deter our founding fathers. It just continued to fuel them. They came to a definitive point in history where men of faith knew honor and justice. Humanity forbade them to tamely surrender that which they had received from their gallant ancestors. They said, our innocent posterity, our children, they were talking about, have a right to receive from us those things that we have been entrusted with, liberty and the life and the pursuit of happiness, we cannot allow our, you might say, complacency, as they said it, and the infamy of the guilt of resigning to inevitably what would await them. It must not be bondage. It must be liberty. That was the American pulpit. John Adams, everyone has seen the pictures of John Adams. He kind of looks like an unassuming guy. Listen to what John Adams said. He said, in a cause which interests the whole globe at a time when my friends and country are in such keen distress, I am scarcely, scarcely ever interrupted in the least degree by apprehensions of my personal safety. I would not have you distressed about me. He's talking to his wife, writing to his wife, Abigail. Danger, they say, makes people valiant. Hitherto... Have people been distressed, but not dismayed? I have felt for my country and her sons. I have bled with them, and I have bled for them. I don't know about you, but he said the, 
it just seems to me the full intention of heaven that we should be taught the full value of our liberty by the dearness of the purchase. When George Washington, right here in Annapolis, get this now, when George Washington, right here in Annapolis, gave his sword and his commission back to the people, when he turned down the kingdom of the Americas, it happened right here in the Maryland State House in Annapolis. That's where our country really began. And George Washington was known for being stoic. And all the people there were all the, you might say, people that we would know from history. All the famous people were there surrounding him. All the people that had fought for you and I in the War for Independence, those veterans. He started doing this. He started reading a role. To us, would just be like just a, another group of names. But to him, it was men that he had fought alongside, that he had seen die in battle. And as he began to read the names of those men, as it was just complete silence in that room that you can go see and see actually where he stood, there was a young lady up in the balcony. She was taking down notes because she knew she was witnessing something historic. She wrote her mother what George Washington did. He said it got to down to about the, the middle, and he broke down and started weeping because he knew what these men had done and how they had suffered and how they had died. And it said it took several minutes for the whole group to kind of get it back together again because when George Washington started weeping, other men started weeping and approaching him and putting their hands on his shoulders and taking out their handkerchiefs and closing their eyes and wiping the tears away. One of them, the Marquis de Lafayette, the French aristocrat that had come here and had done so much for our country and was so valiant and courageous fighting for liberty. What I'm saying is our country began right here in the Maryland State House that was our national capital for about 90 days, our first <coughs> national capital. Why? Because these men had burning within them a sacred fire, something that was so bright that consumed them to a point where they didn't think about the fact that they were half starving, half clothed, and half armed when they were running into battle on a forced march through the snow, leaving bloody footprints behind because they didn't even have enough shoe leather. That didn't deter them. You know why? Because they had a fire burning with them. Going all the way back to men like Obadiah Holmes that was being beaten to death. They tried to beat him to death, the Puritans. Puritans are not heroes of mine because he was a Baptist preacher and he didn't take a license from the state-run church. And so they started beating him in the street. And it says, written history, his blood was running through the cobblestones like a river. He couldn't sleep for months afterwards, but on his elbows and his knees propped up on either side because his back was so torn. They were trying to kill him. And you know what he said? He said, you beat me as with roses. You know why? Because he had a fire burning within him that so consumed him, that was so bright that people realized it. I want to ask you this. When was the last time someone saw that fire burning in you? See, before the law, God appeared to Moses in that burning bush. It says, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame a fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. That was before the law. As Moses led the people of Israel out of the bondage of, of Egypt to the promised land, it says in Exodus 13, verse 21, and the Lord went before them by a, in the day by a pillar of cloud and led them in a way by night in a pillar of fire. Then came the law as Moses came down from Mount Sinai. It says in Deuteronomy 9, and verse 15, I, so I turned and came down from the mount, and the mount burned with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. He was talking about a fire on the mountain, but also burning within him. Outside the tabernacle, the fire was 
commanded to be kept burning, Leviticus 6 and verse 12, and the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay burnt offering on it every night upon it, and, and it shall burn thereof the fat of the peace offerings. It was a perpetual fire because it was started by God, and it was God's presence among them. A lot of times people say, well, I'll just stir up the fire. You can't. You can't stir up anything. God started the fire. What you need to do is ask God to stir it up. You know why? Because we're too comfortable, that's why. We're still too comfortable. You know why <clears throat> this last midterm wasn't a red wave? Because we're still too comfortable. That's why. You know why the 2020 election was, was taken was because we're still too comfortable. And we're putting too much faith in people. Hey, government's not the answer. Government's the problem. Amen. Hello? Yes. And what we need to do is get back to our knees and start realizing it's God's house that's going to make all the difference. Amen. It's not going to be the, the, the church house, I mean, excuse me, the, the, uh, the, uh, the courthouse, the state house. It's going to be God's house. God's house. Here. Right here. You. Now let me just say this. There's enough people right here. If you start praying with the sacred fire that God wants us to, hey, it could change the course of our nation. That's why I get so excited every time I get before a group of people because I know there's enough power in this one room to literally call God's attention down in our nation and allow his miraculous divine hand of, of intervention to do something. Amen. There's more than 56 people here today. Our nation started with 56 people. Hello? Amen. Are you with me today? Amen. What I'm saying is, my wife and I, we, we have a, a wood stove at home. I love our wood stove. It's called a yodel. It's spelled with, spelled with a J, but it's silent J, so it's a yodel. Like, you know, you want to tell a good yolk? <laughs> Talking about eggs? No. Okay. It's just Norwegian way. But it's called a yodel, and, and it's got a huge piece of ambient glass in the front. And so when you get the, you put the wood in perpendicular, and, and then you start going, and, and it's all, it's, it's not electrical, it's just, just a regular, but it, boy, that, that fire just swirls in there. It's beautiful. And I told my wife, I said, you know what this is? This is amazing. I said, when we put wood in there, that wood was a tree at one time. And for years, it soaked up the energy of the sun for years. And then it was cut down and split and dried. And now it's burning in our wood stove. And it's giving off that heat from the sun that it's stored up for years. I said, you know what that is? That's God Amen. in our house. When you see a fire burning... That's God. And then I thought, that sacred fire. You know, it's much the same. We are the altar. We are the fireplace, you might say. But what do we need? We need some fuel, don't we? Don't we need some fuel to burn? You know, here's the problem. A lot of times Christians are walking around and, and they're down to just a little flicker. Sometimes you say, boy, that person seems like they're a little cold. Yeah, because they haven't got the fuel on the fire. What's the fuel? It's God's word. See, what you're holding in your hand right now, that's the greatest book that there is. Only problem is, that being the greatest book, is the thing that Christians basically deal with the least most times in their life. Huh? What I'm saying is what we need to do, I don't know about you, I want people to see something different in me. What about you? You know, and, and my wife and I, we get this all the time, and we're not anything. We're not anything, but, but I tell you what I have learned I've learned about a, a fire burning within me, so I'm going to put the wood on that, that altar, which is the fireplace, so to speak. I'm going to put the wood, I'm going to read the Bible, meditate upon God's word. I'm, I'm going to pray. That's all part of the fuel, right? And then I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit of God to breathe on it after God ignites it. Because he's the only one that can ignite it. We were walking, we were uh, from the parking lot over to BWI, like, I, like your pastor said, I traveled 52 of the 52 weeks last year. I traveled even Christmas and New Year's weekend and preached somewhere last year. This year I'm taking those two off. My wife says, what if someone calls? I'm going to tell them, no. <laughs> Just that easy, okay, no. And, uh, but I, I didn't last year. But in any case, you know, we were traveling from the parking lot to BWI, as, as we do, as we did every week last year. And uh, a, a guy looked at me and said, you're a Christian. I said, what? He said, you're a Christian, aren't you? We were just talking. I said, yeah. I said, how, how did you know? He said, I could see the light. I went, oh, wow, that's, thank you, Lord. 
And, th and then he said, I bet you, you're, you're not just, you are a preacher. I said, really? He said, I walk up to Southwest where the people are taking your luggage, and there's ladies that say, hey, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, how do, how do you know that? She said, she, I just, I can see it. I can see it. I, we were walking out of Walmart, and the, the greeter said, hey, oh, you're, who are you? You're, you've got to know the Lord, don't you? I said, yeah. It happens all the time. You know why? Because my wife and I learned, hey, you put the wood on, you put the fuel there, you ask God to ignite it, and then the Holy Spirit to breathe upon it. Amen. Amen. That oxygen. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, and look, look like you are inside. You say, what do you mean? Uh, my sister came to hear me speak down in Florida. She said, you know one thing that really convicted me? She said, when you talked about smiling, she said, I feel good all the time, but sometimes I realize I don't smile naturally. So she said, I'm going to work at smiling more. I said, that's good. That's a real good thing. Because, you know, I mean, we need to. Don't you think? We need to smile more. Amen. But look, if I smile and my smile is basically the cause of someone coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to keep that going on. Amen. You know, and traveling is very tiring. I see this all the time. Someone pulling their suitcase, going through the airport. And I say, hey, how you doing? They went, what? I said, you doing okay? Yeah, and they start smiling. It's amazing. When you smile at people, how they smile back at you, you know? I've not had many people that, when I smile at them, just look at me like, what are you doing, you know? Normally, they'll smile back. And if they don't, I'll smile even bigger. <laughs> Almost like crazy, you know? And then they'll go, oh, what? and maybe they'll smile as they walk away or something, you know? But what I'm saying is, hey, I, I want to make sure that there's something burning within me. What about you? I, I walked into a clothier place, and, and the guy said, you're not the normal person that comes in here. I said, what do you mean? There's something different about you. What is there different about you? I said, well, let me tell you. Pulled out a tract. Started witnessing to him. What, what I'm saying is this. Look, folks, too many times this old world has a way of extinguishing our sacred fire down to a flicker. We cannot allow that to happen. Not in the time that we live. This is harvest time. You heard your pastor. Most exciting time to live in history is right now. Why? Because the Lord's coming back soon. And it's harvest time. I get people attracted. I say, you know what this, this is? What is this? I said, this is good news from a far country. We all need good news, don't we? And I shake my head as I'm saying that, and they start shaking their head. Isn't it interesting how people do that? You look at it and you say, yeah, it's good news. From and they go, yeah. I said, we all need good news, don't we? Yes, we do. I said, would you read that? Yes, I'm going to read that. It's amazing. And I mean, you know, you wouldn't believe some of the people uh, that I've given it to. Uh, you know, they are all different types of people, but they all say the same thing. I'm going to read that. I'm going to read that. Look, what we have to understand is don't look to the world's fire. The world offers a strange fire. I'm almost done. The world offers a strange fire, fire on emotionalism. Go to some of these churches, look like nightclubs, got all the rock and roll bands. <laughs> Trying to bring, you know, get people going emotionally. That's the world's fire. God talks about a strange fire. He killed Nadab and Abihu because they offered strange fire. I don't want to... I want that consuming fire. Someone asked me not too long ago, Brother Harding, are, are you going to retire? I, I said, what? They, he said, well, you, you're 69 now. Are you going to retire? I said, why, do you, why should I retire? So you can do exactly what you want to do. <laughs> I said, I'm doing that right now. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with retiring. You know, some people may have a very laborious job, and you retire, and then you, yeah, you go. But I, I'm doing exactly what I want to do right now. Amen. So are you going to retire? No. I'm not going to retire. I'm going to refire. Amen. I'm, just, I'm not going to burn out. I'm going to burn up. Amen. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just keep on going for the Lord. Amen. Say, well, <clears throat> how can I get the, the fire? Have the desire. You have the desire for the fire? Huh? How hungry are you? Everyone hungry? Anyone not eat breakfast today? Who didn't eat breakfast? Okay, you're the hungry ones. Okay. Okay? Uh, and, you know, how many haven't had a drink of water for a while? Okay? Yeah. Are you thirsty? So am I. 
Uh, I want to be real thirsty for the Lord. What about you? I want to be real hungry for God. Do, don't you? I, I want to be so hungry, there's only one thing that will satisfy me, and that's God. And if you do that, guess what? You got all that fuel, and you go before the Lord in the morning. Let me ask you, what's the last thing you think about at night? Huh? What's the last thing? The problems of the day? Or is it the problem solver? Huh? Is it, is it what's going on with your finances, or is it the great financier? What's the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning? I got a snuffy nose, or this or that, or I got an ache here, or a pain there. Or how about, Lord, thank you for a good night's sleep last night. Those of you that get any sleep, the, the new parents back there, amen. I, you say, he, I was saying, well, how are you doing? Well, we're just trying to get some sleep. I said, that's why you have them when you're young. Amen. But hey, even if I don't get a good night's sleep, I thank God for the sleep that I did, right? Amen. First thing in the morning, we need to focus upward. Last thing at night, focused upward. You know why? Because then you get up in the morning, you got all these dreams. How many dream crazy dreams? Huh? You ever dream crazy dreams? I have this craziest dreams. Thankfully, I don't remember most of them, okay? But what I do when I get up, I say, Lord, forgive me for what my thoughts may have been throughout the night. Lord, please, I'm, I'm going to start thinking about some scriptures. I'm going to start loading on the fuel because I want you to touch it and ignite it. Oh, I want to I feel it burning. You know why? Because then the Christian life is easy. It doesn't make any difference what your problems are. You have in you a consuming fire. See, there's a lot of people out there that are not, not, not here, but there's a lot of people out there I have no idea what we're talking about here today. About the, a consuming fire. I, I mean, look. <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak, you know. And, and I, I look out, even amongst this auditorium, and I see people almost in a comatose right, right now. I'm 10 minutes over. Okay, and I get that, all right? I'm about, about to share. But what I'm saying is, hey, we need, to, we need to get God to stir us within. Get that fire going again so that people can see it. When was the last time, when was the last time that someone asked you, what's, what's different about you? Huh? When was the last time someone said, you know, look, judgment in our life, it can be burned up by that fire, by confessing our sins before God. He warned Eli. He warns us too. When he warns us, put that before him and say, Lord, forgive me. And whew, fire within us. It takes us from the world. It destroys those things that God doesn't want us to have. It separates us. It sanctifies us for service for him. I don't know about you. I want that fire burning. Oh, I, I want it. I want it because I understand it's his forgiveness. It's leading. It's purifying. Don't you want to be purified? Oh, I love to be able to be purified by God and have a clean heart and a clean mind. Don't you? Amen. Got one amen on that. It's very good. Amen. It's one. So as we close today, just let me ask, ask you this. There's not one of us here today that doesn't love this word. But there's not one of us here today that couldn't love it more. Would you agree with me? Okay. There's not one of us that does not cherish prayer. But there's not one of us that could cherish prayer more. We sing that song, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sweet Hour. When was the last time you prayed for an hour? Not by looking at your watch. You say, well, how can I? Here's one way right here you can... You can start praying scripture. My, oh, my. Instead of looking, well, is it an hour yet? See, if, if you're looking at your watch to see if it's an hour, then you've got a great lack in your prayer life. Okay? My wife knows I have a very extensive prayer list. I pray for your pastor every day. I pray for his family by name every day. I pray for this church by name every day. And I pray for a large amount of missionaries and people that are in service, people that are in Washington, D.C., 
that was, and, and there's just, there's friends and family. It takes me a long time to get through my prayer list, but it's not ever burdened. It's always a blessing. And uh, that, uh, did I tell you about my suits the last time I was here? About my suits? I tell you about my suits? I tell you about my suits? You remember this? About my suits? God answers amazing prayers when you get serious. So many Christians living so far below. There's not one of us that doesn't love the souls of men that could love the souls of men more. Are you soul conscious? I don't feel fully dressed unless I have tracks on me. I mean, I'll, I travel all the time. I'm always giving tracks out to everyone. And, and I love it because I come up beside people that are waiting for their luggage. <laughs> I start talking to them. I, 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 I make them my friend, first of all. And then I give them a tract. I mean, I, we do that all the time, everywhere we go. My wife and I, we've been married for 47 years. She still giggles. I can still make my wife giggle. That's pretty good, don't you think? To 47 years. She's giggling. We're walking up to a cash register, and people say, oh, you two must be newlyweds. Yes, we are. How long have you been married? 47 years. They go, what are you on? You know, I want some of that. OK, did they sell it over here? I mean, where? I said, no, it's him. Oh, really? Let me show you how. See, most people don't understand the fire within can only be ignited by God. And we need to think more of God's word, more of prayer, and more of the souls of men. Wouldn't you like God just to stir those embers? Do you feel a little cold today? I do from time to time as well. I said, Lord, I, I don't, I feel a little cold. I, I need your stirring, Lord. I need you stirring me up. And uh, guess what? He does. That's how our country began. By men that would not be deterred from their course because they had a sacred fire burn, burning inside. With this, I'll close. George Marion, the Swamp Fox. I think I've told the story before. Him and his men would run into the swamp. The British couldn't follow him because he knew the swamp and they didn't. They would be caught in quicksand and eaten by animals. And so he would hit them and run into the swamp. And sure enough, the lieutenant was brought in by his commander to go and do a little reconnoiter. And so under a flag of truce, uh, he came into the camp and, and then came back to report. And this is what he told his lieutenant. That this, is, this is the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Amen. Okay? He saw men that were hardly clothed, clothing literally just rotting off of their backs. They were hungry. You could count the ribs in their skin. I, I guarantee you most of us, no one could count one rib, OK? All right? And then, and then they were fighting with dilapidated weapons. But this is what he said. They're going to win. He said, why, why would you say that? He said, because I looked into their eyes and they had something burning there. They were hardly clothed. They were hardly fed. They hardly had enough weapons. When I look at our men, fully clothed, wonderfully fed, amazing weaponry, I don't see that fire in their eyes, but I see it in theirs. Because of that, they're going to win. And guess what? We did. Amen. By a sacred fire birthed through the pulpit to our founding fathers and to the men and women that fought the battles. Wouldn't you like to be one of those... Yeah. Patriots today that have within you a flame of fire. You say, well, how do I get that? You know, the first thing we do is we humble ourselves. You say, how? You know where the fire fell in the Old Testament? It fell at the altar where God's best people did God's best work. See, I don't care. If, if it's coming to an altar, if I need to come to an altar to start the process of really getting that sacred fire going, I'm going to come to an altar. I'll do anything that's scriptural. And definitely at an altar where the fire fell. So I'm going to ask you, I'm, I'm going to pray today at the altar because I need that continual sacred fire as well. I'm going to ask you to join me this morning. If you want that sacred fire that God's been allowing me to talk about today, it starts right here by us humbling ourselves. So would you stand? I'm not going to ask the piano to play. I'm just going to ask you to stand. Come to an old-fashioned altar. Just come right, right now. I love the Bible, but I could love it more. And we're not going to hesitate. If God spoke to your heart, would you move upon the altar today? I want that sacred fire, and I'm willing to humble myself in order to do it, to get to an altar where the fire falls. Oh, I don't normally go to the altar. <clears throat> well, 
How hungry are you? I don't normally go to the altar. How thirsty are you for, for God? Praying, denying of yourself, serving others with a, a good attitude. Others, others, others. But the wording, I've not gone to an altar before. Yeah, I, I never got saved, got saved the first time. I never was baptized till I was baptized the first time. Everything that I've ever done in my Christian life has been not really comfortable, but wonderful. I want that sacred fire, Brother Harding. I want it. I want it. I want it so badly, I'll, I'll do anything scriptural to get it. And to even say, well, I, I just don't have the desire. God will give you the desire. You can even ask him for that. Ask God for that desire. As these are praying, this last question that I must ask is all eyes are closed and heads are bowed. Is there anyone today that would say, Brother Harding, I don't even know for sure where I'm going, where I'm going when I die. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I'm not sure I got that destination settled, but I'm positive I don't want to go to hell. I've never accepted that gift of eternal life that you talked about today. Brother Harding, would you pray for me? Here's my hand. Anyone like that today? Lift up your hand right back down. I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure. No one's going to embarrass you. But if you want me to pray for you, you've got to raise your hand so I know who you are. Anyone like that? Anyone like that? All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for that sacred fire. Thank you for Brother Connor and his church and these dear people. Bless, Lord, what has been said now we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, what a wonderful message. And uh, all right. Um, do we have a bus today? Okay. Um, let's go ahead and dismiss the bus workers. I'm going to ask Brother Harding and uh, Mrs. Harding maybe if you stand by the table and uh, see them on the way out. And we're going to have a great, great service this evening. I know it. Uh, 530. So, <clears throat> amen. That was. Uh, hey, John, yes, sir. Okay, amen. Wait, when I was there, I saw the old line station. Okay. And you want to talk about the stars too? Yeah. Okay, amen. <laughs> amen. All right. Uh, wow, that's good. Okay. Um, Brother Al, would you dismiss us in prayer this morning, please? Amen.